which means I'll be uh, showing you some pictures and some text, and hopefully that will help you uh, pay attention during the lecture. So I'm just going to do that now. Okay, there we go. So hopefully everyone has that. So that's the title of the talk. And I'm gonna start by going back to my hometown and a very special place in my hometown of Edmonton, Alberta in Canada. And that's this, this is Commonwealth Stadium, a 60,000 seat outdoor stadium in the heart of the city. Uh, here we have flooded it so, uh, so we can play hockey on it but normally uh, Commonwealth Stadium is the home of the Edmonton Eskimos football team and this is a bit of an institution in our city and for many 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 years certainly as long as I can ever remember going to Edmonton Eskimo games the snack of the stadium was peanuts in the shell so you get these big bags of peanuts for probably a dollar or something like that. And throughout the game, you'd crack them open. You'd leave the peanut shells just beneath your seat or on the floor. And when you left the stadium, you'd basically be shuffling through peanut shells, thousands and thousands and thousands of peanut shells. And as you might imagine, about your feet, there'd be this sort of peanut dust that would hover just above the ground. Well, this all changed in 2006. An Edmonton Eskimo fan, a young guy about 10 or 11 years old, wrote to the president of the Edmonton Eskimos and said that he was allergic to peanuts and that all the peanuts in the stadium made going to the games really uncomfortable for him. Within days, peanuts were banned from the stadium. Now, for Edmonton Eskimo fans, I'm sure they were a bit disappointed, uh, but they got on with it. This all changed a few years later when the rock band ACDC came to town. And there was a bit more of a discussion because in the advice given to concert goers, they were told not to bring guns, knives, alcohol, drugs, or peanuts to the stadium and a wee bit of a debate erupted. On the one side were those people who thought this was a good idea. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read some of these quotations out in a, in a genuine Edmonton, Alberta accent. <laughs> accent. Uh, you need to learn about allergies. I'm so allergic to peanut products that I will swell up like a balloon. Once on a plane trip to France, some bonehead decided to eat a peanut butter sandwich. We had to make an emergency landing about 20 minutes later. You know, I could have died on that plane. Now these boneheads want to bring peanuts to the concert just because they have no sense of well-being. Well, what if I smell your peanuts and die, huh? What if? I, I should say these were comments made to the newspaper. Seriously, pe people. First off, peanuts have been banned from the stadium for years now. Second off, since when do you need peanuts to enjoy an ACDC concert? I could understand if they banned alcohol, but seriously, peanuts? On the other side of the debate were these sorts of comments. Jesus, if you're that allergic, then carry a medical kit to deal with the situation. I'm so sick and tired of situations where 60,000 people have to change what they do because one person can't be bothered to look after themselves and be prepared. Sorry you're allergic, but enough already. The world isn't turning only for you. What's this world coming to? Why ban peanuts to a show for a small population? If you people are sick, then don't come to the show. You can't have an allergic reaction to the smell of peanuts. Go back to your doctor and get the real facts. If I can't enjoy a good bag of peanuts while I listen to ACDC, then I might as well end it all. Thanks, all you allergy wusses. I hope you're happy. I'm bringing peanuts in and nobody can stop me. Now, I kind of assume that the last two comments were not completely serious, but the debate really summed up what was going on more broadly about banning peanuts from public spaces. And so, in this talk, what I'm going to do is give you a bit of a history of food allergy leading us up to 
the situation uh, we experienced in Edmonton about 10 years ago. I'll talk about how reactions to food were described before the term allergy was invented about a hundred and some years ago. I'll talk about how during the early 20th century, how food allergists started to understand the concept of food allergy. Then I'll go and discuss how food allergy took an environmental turn and allergies started to begin, became understood as, as part of our environment, our response to the environment. And then I'll talk a bit about uh, what happened when peanut allergy became the, the prototypical food allergy. And if you're interested in more about this, there's a copy of my book there, Another Person's Poison. Um, there, there's also an audio book. Uh, I, I, the person who did the narration is a, an American with a strange accent, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but you know, there's, a, there's copies in the library, so there you go. Okay, so let's go into the Wayback Machine to, to ancient Greece. And although food allergy as we know it didn't really exist per se, um, certainly going back long, long ways, there were always strange reactions to different foods. And this, this quotation from the, the uh, grand, great grandfather of medicine, Hippocrates really sums it up nicely. Cheese does not harm all men alike. Some can eat their fill of it without the slightest hurt. Nay, those it agrees with are wonderfully strengthened thereby. Others come off badly. Now, we don't really know what coming off badly means specifically for Hippocrates, but any of, any of us who may have a milk allergy might have uh, an understanding of what he means by that. Now, for most of human history up until the 20th century, these sort of reactions were not described as allergies. That's a 20th century term. Sometimes they were described, however, as idiosyncrasies. So strange um, responses that were idiosyncratic to an in individual's uh, disposition. And if we look at other people who uh, were prominent in uh, creating medicine as we know it, Galen, uh, Maimonides, Ibn Sina, and others, they all mention symptoms that sound a bit like food allergy. And some of these foods could be uh, foods that you ate on a daily basis, so milk, eggs, cheese, seafood. And other examples were foods that were more seasonal. So right now we're in asparagus season and we're getting strawberries as well. There's a great story about Richard III, who was apparently allergic to strawberries. They made him come out in a rash and he tricked one of his uh, rivals uh, into giving him some strawberries and then accused him of witchcraft and had him executed. So sometimes allergies can be used for nefarious uh, purposes as well. And in terms of the symptoms that were described prior to the 20th century, a lot of these symptoms were similar to what we might see today. So nausea, hives, skin problems, migraine headaches, and asthma. But just like today, physicians debated about just how much these allergies were causing problems. So I'll give you two examples of that talking about migraine. So this was sometimes known as sick headache. And here we have a quotation from John Fothergill from the late 18th century. And he's talking about the sort of things that cause a migraine headache and talking about different foods, melted butter, fat meat, spices, black pepper, meat pies, baked puddings. He goes on to say that alcohol can also cause these sick headaches. And so for the patient, what to do? Avoid these foods and you will avoid the headache. Well, a little bit more, or about a century later, we get another response from another uh, physician. This is Edward Living. And he's talking about how, in his opinion, although some people did experience these problems, there was also a real, um, a real appetite in the public for blaming food for these sorts of symptoms. So he says, so deeply rooted with the general public is the notion that most headaches are produced by this cause, meaning food, that the greatest caution is necessary in accepting statements 
which such person make on this subject. So he's basically saying, don't listen to your patients too carefully, figure it out for yourself. And this, this idea of, you know, to what extent do you trust the, what the patient is reporting about their allergies, that, and, and to what extent do you trust what you're observing in your patient, that is one of the, one of the most important debates within the history of allergy. So even before the term allergy was, was coined, there was a lot of debate about the extent to which food could cause these chronic health problems. I'm just going to mention one final example because I think it's, well, it's, it's quite funny. <laughs> so this is a letter to the British Medical Journal. And for me, it kind of highlights how deep-rooted some of these ideas about idiosyncrasy were during the late 19th century. So what this uh, letter writer is saying is that he is allergic to uh, meat, but not fowl. So he's not allergic to chicken and turkey and pheasant and things like that, but he is allergic to other forms of meat, pork, beef, etc. And of course, one of the great debates was whether the duck-billed platypus was a bird or a mammal. So he says, if, if, you make, if you made it worth my while, I will come down at the Whitsuntide uh, holidays and be exhibited. I'll eat the platypus and finally determine whether it be bird or beast. So he's saying he's so convinced that he's allergic to meat that if he comes down with his symptoms, then clearly the platypus is not a bird, it is a beast. Okay, so let's get into the 20th century and uh, discuss how the term allergy comes to be. So here is the uh, individual who coins the term allergy. And the term itself comes from the Greek and really means other reaction. So this is Clemens von Perke. He's a Viennese pediatrician. And he was involved in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century in uh, vaccination campaigns in Vienna, vaccinating children in particular against the uh, deadly infectious diseases of the period. And one of the things that he noticed is that when you injected some children with the uh, serum of uh, uh, an animal uh, that, uh, that had had this particular disease, that often they had these strange reactions. And he noticed that the reactions were very similar to reactions that people would have when they ate certain types of food, when they might have been stung by a bee, uh, or to hay fever, or to asthma, same sorts of symptoms. And he came up with this term allergy. Now, the, the way he defined allergy is really important. So it comes from the Greek, other reaction, but how he precisely defined it was as any form of altered biological reactivity. So what he meant by that was any time the body reacted to a foreign substance. And for him, this could be a, uh, a positive reaction, so protecting the body against an infection, or it could be uh, a negative reaction, so overreacting to a bee, st a bee sting, or to pollen in the air, or to a certain type of food, for whom most people benefited, but other people uh, had strange reactions to. So it was really quite a, a broad definition. There was another term, however, which was coined at roughly the same period. And this was coined by the, the French physiologist, Charles Richet, who would uh, eventually win the Nobel Prize for <clears throat> his discoveries in immunology. And he came up with the term anaphylaxis, again, coming from the Greek or meaning against protection. Now, this was a much more uh, specific term or eventually it came to be thought of in more specific terms. So during the first few decades of the 20th century, allergy and anaphylaxis were used interchangeably. But by the 1930s, <clears throat> Allergy was seen as more of a, a catch-all term for any type of um, overreaction to foreign proteins in the environment, and anaphylaxis became known as the intense acute reaction that you get that uh, often to peanuts or, or other types of food that can be highly dangerous. So we get this 
the reason this is important is that we get this differentiation between these acute, really dangerous, sudden reactions and the more chronic, delayed, lingering reactions, still very uh, disruptive to life, but not necessarily as dangerous as an anaphylactic reaction. So just keep, keep those terms in the back of your head for a little bit. I'm gonna introduce another animal now. <laughs> That's Marie the walrus. So allergy becomes a very uh, popular term within even a few decades of its being coined by von Perke. And food allergy becomes one of the most popular manifestations of allergy. Now, this caused problems because allergy or food allergy had to be diagnosed and treated differently than other types of allergy. So I'll, I'll compare, um, say, a, a pollen allergy to a food allergy. So by the early 20th century, the way that you diagnosed a pollen allergy was by taking a tiny little bit of pollen, injecting it in someone, and seeing if their skin erupted in a bit of a bump or a wheel. If it did, then it was likely that the person was allergic to that pollen and that they could go about desensitization treatment. And desensitization treatment was introducing absolutely minute particles of the pollen into the patient and building them up until they developed a resistance to the pollen. So that was how you treated a lot of allergies. That did not work with food allergy. <clears throat> For one, there are far too many false positives and negatives when you use skin testing. For uh, the other reason is that skin testing using uh, food could also be quite dangerous. There were a number of fatalities uh, early on in the 1930s and 40s, for example, when too much of the allergen was injected into an individual. So early on, there's this, there's this gulf between how food allergists see food allergy and how other allergists see food allergy. So I've described these as food allergists and orthodox allergists. The orthodox allergists want to define food allergy very, very narrowly uh, and really only encompassing examples in which the reaction is quick and immediate and obvious like anaphylaxis. Uh, the food allergists see allergy or food allergy is much more common and tend to diagnose it uh, through a series of elimination diets, and that involves the patient. So they end up having a really close reaction a re relationship with their patients. They have to rely on the evidence of the patient to, di to, to come up with the diagnosis. So why do I have a picture of the walrus? Well, by the 1930s, food allergy was common enough that it was even being diagnosed in animals. So this is Marie the walrus. She was... Uh, uh, walrus napped from the coast of Alaska and uh, sent down to uh, the, the, <clears throat> the San Diego Zoo in California in the 1930s. And she was fed on a dairy uh, diet before she had teeth. And she developed all sorts of allergic symptoms. She'd get rashes and she'd have rhinitis or mucus would come out of her. She'd get ulcers. She was generally miserable until she grew teeth and she could eat the regular walrus diet of crustaceans and, and seafood. And then all the symptoms disappeared. So even within the, the walrus veterinary community, they were understanding the concept of food allergy. But because of this, this gap in understanding, there was all, always this sort of suspicion of food allergy. It was often called witchcraft, a fad, or a racket. And this would have major repercussions later on. Now, one alternative way of understanding allergy was through psychosomatic theory. So psychosomatic uh, theory involves the relationship between the mind and the body. So if you're really stressed out because of something going on in your life, uh, your immune system might <clears throat> weaken and you might be more susceptible to getting, uh, getting a flu or COVID or whatever. And very, very early on in the emergence of psychosomatic theory, allergy gets lumped into uh, 
the understanding of psychosomatic uh, problems. So Eric Whitcover, Whitcower comes up with this idea of the allergic personality. So the allergic symptoms are not actual physical symptoms. They are actually manifestations of what's going on in, in, in someone's mind. And some of the solutions that were recommended for this were quite, um, were quite something. So psychoanalysis, fine, hypnosis, but also something called parentectomy. So taking children away from a stressful family environment. Now this, could, this didn't have to be as severe as one might think. This could be simply sending the kid away to school at a, at a boarding school. So the idea was that allergists had not had to do more than just look at um, the physical manifestations. They also had to be psychiatrists in the way. They had to think about the, uh, what was going on in the mind of their patient. And the reason we have an a, a image of an advertisement from Thorazine Thorazine is a, is a powerful antipsychotic medication. And so the idea is that if your patient is suffering from severe bursitis, give her some Thorazine because what's happening is all in her head. So this, this demonstrates how, how far along these psychosomatic ideas uh, came. And another example comes from this journal, The Nervous Child, which was uh, published during the 1940s and 50s a lot of different childhood uh, allergic symptoms were blamed on things going on in the home. During the post-war period, however, other concerns started to uh, bring about different theories of allergy. And this is my environmental turn in allergy, so to speak. So in the United States, for example, there's a lot of concern in the 1950s about food chemicals. We have the Delaney Clause, which is passed in 1958, which determines that the Food and Drug Administration shall not approve for use in food or any chemical additive found to induce cancer in man or after test found to induce cancer in animals. So this, this only pertains to cancer, but it creates this idea in many people's minds that these food chemicals, which were largely a product of the Second World War, should not be or could, could pose dangers to human health. Now, this, this idea uh, became much more popular after the publication of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson in 1962. Carson's focus is largely on pesticides, and most of it is on the natural environment, but there is a chapter on the impact of these chemicals on humans. And then a food allergist named Theron Rand Randolph also publishes in the same year, Human Ecology and Susceptibility to the Chemical Environment, where he lays uh, all sorts of examples out of how different chemicals in the environment can cause uh, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of allergic symptoms. Now, as you might expect, there was also this, already this gulf and understanding between food allergists and orthodox allergists, casting allergy in this uh, environmental tone just makes the division between the food allergists and the orthodox allergists even further, even more controversial. And so you end up getting um, the gulf widening even further. <clears throat> And so one thing that happens in the mid-1960s uh, that transforms the debates about food allergy further is the identification of the uh, antibody believed to cause allergy, and that is immunoglobulin E, or IgE, which is found or identified in 1966. So for orthodox allergists, if you can see IgE, then it's an allergy. But for people like Theron Randolph, they're not interested in IgE. They think it's only one possible way of demonstrating allergy. And if they can see that their patients are suffering and if they can do uh, an elimination diet and identify that this food is causing these symptoms, then they're gonna trust that far more than they trust uh, a lab result demonstrating that there is or is not IgE in the patient's blood. And so we get this offshoot of food allergy emerging called clinical ecology and Theron Randolph, who I mentioned, is really the father of clinical ecology. 
And although some clinical, well, probably most clinical ecologists are very well-meaning and um, just trying to help their patients, we also get this rather unscrupulous uh, group of clinicians, and, and I hesitate almost to use the term clinicians, uh, people taking advantage of the situation in the United States in particular. And because IgE could be uh, determined in a blood test, they set up these labs where people can send samples of their blood, the blood is tested in a lab, and then they come back to the patient saying, oh yeah, you're allergic to this, that, and the other. And so these advertisements are actual advertisements. Um, I think the one on the right with the, with the image, uh, the foods you love may not love you, that I think that was that might have been in, in the Wall Street Journal, in fact. And the, the marginalia, the, the, the writing on the side of it, it basically says, uh, this is coming from the American Academy of Allergy, and the writing is expressing their concern about these ads. Now, ultimately, this becomes a legal matter, partly because in the United States, people need medical insurance to pay for different treatments, and the American Academy of Allergy does not want clinical ecologists to, to have their services uh, eligible for such uh, insurance. And so it becomes a real big fight in the 1970s and 80s. Now, this brings us up to the 1980s, which means we're starting to talk about peanuts. Now, as a historian, I do a lot of digging around in medical journals, looking for you know, the first example I can find a peanut allergy, the first example of this or that. And I've done a lot of digging about peanut allergy, and you cannot find any examples in medical journals of fatal peanut allergies prior to the mid-1980s. This quotation here, however, indicates that some allergists were starting to become concerned about peanuts and the, the risks, the allergic risks that they posed. So this comes from uh, Joseph Fries, and he's saying peanuts are potent antigens, just how potent has never fully been explored. There's no documentation of fatal or near fatal anaphylaxis reactions in the medical literature, although explosive allergic reactions to the ingestion of related substances like chickpeas and other types of beans have been described. Now he's right. I, I couldn't find any examples of uh, anaphylactic or fatal anaphylactic reactions in the literature either. However, there were one or two, well, one, let's just say one example I found from the early 1970s uh, in, a, in a newspaper. And this, this is described on the right there, the boy who died for want of a label. And this is a little boy uh, who ate uh, some ice cream, Butterfinger ice cream uh, that had peanuts in it, peanut butter in it. He didn't know it had peanut butter in it, and he died of a reaction because of it. And so Jean Mayer, who's a Franco-American uh, Franco nutritionist, uh, writes about this and tries to get some more publicity about the, the potential risks that uh, allergens such as peanuts pose to people when the labels aren't clear. He doesn't really get very far. And that's partly because this reaction, this fatal reaction was quite rare. The first fatal reactions you tend to, you find, come from the late 1980s. The first one I found comes from the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and then another one in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And what's interesting is often these reactions involve cases in which peanut products have been introduced into other food products. So in one case, peanut oil was included in a cake. In another case, peanut butter was added to uh, chili to thicken it. Both of these cases resulted in fatalities. But soon, in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, more and more cases began to be identified and action started to be taken place. Action often led by parents. So we start to get peanuts banned from uh, public spaces, Commonwealth Stadium, of course, but other places, you know, take me out to the ball game, give me, give me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. Peanuts are in Cracker Jack as well. Um, so you get peanut-free zones in certain baseball places, ba baseball stadiums. 
we get peanuts banned from certain air, airlines, or you get the messages on airlines or air, airplanes if someone is allergic. But probably more important, we start getting peanuts banned in schools and nurseries, where, especially in North America, peanuts and peanut butter had been absolutely omnipresent. When I was growing up in Canada in the, in the 19, late 1970s and 1980s, I would estimate that 80% of my lunches contained peanut butter. It was just the simplest way to cram some calories and protein and fiber into my body when I was going to, when I was going to school. Now, no longer. And even in some schools, you have peanut sniffing pooches, uh, peanut uh, dogs that can, can sniff peanuts to protect kids in the school. So we have this real, this real shift um, from peanuts being not really much of a concern at all to peanuts being banned from places where they used to be absolutely present. So why does this happen? Well, unlike other dangers posed by food, peanut allergy presents a clear and present danger. Um, it's not a reaction that takes a while to manifest, it happens immediately and it can be fatal. And, and so people have to treat it seriously. But I think if we look at it a bit more carefully, there are other reasons why peanut allergy became such a leg legitimate uh, concern and why such action was taken against us. And they're listed down there. So it, it's, it, it helps to legitimize food allergy. The bizarre nature of the reactions plays a role. We also have patient-led lobbying, which is important. And even uh, peanut allergy can be, or allergy more generally, can be used by food companies as a mar marketing strategy. So this table basically compares how food allergy, our understanding of food allergy changes uh, prior to the 1990s and today. And so when we have peanut allergy entering the discussion, Allergy transforms from something that's delayed, chronic, and lingering to something that's immediate, acute, and anaphylactic. It's potentially fatal. Unlike other allergies, which can cause a wide range of symptoms, anaphylaxis is recognizable and quite specific. It's, only, it's also very easy to trace uh, peanuts. It's much, much easier to trace peanuts than it is to trace something like egg or flour, which is present all throughout different sorts of foods. We also get the uh, evidence of IgE. And because it's relatively rare, uh, it's easier to focus on it than focusing on more uh, chronic uh, food, allergy, food allergens, so allergies caused by wheat, meat, milk, egg, potato, beans, and indeed food, allergy, food additives. So the bizarre nature of these reactions are also, are, have, have also played a big role in, in, in sparking public awareness. So here are two examples from Quebec in Canada. One was this case of the, the fatal pe peanut butter kiss. So a 15 year old girl kissed her boyfriend and then died of a, a, a anaphylactic reaction to peanuts. The, uh, the guess or the, the, the theory was that the boy had had peanut butter sandwich earlier. Um, now this was, it was, it was never confirmed by the coroner, um, but if you read the coroner report, it is, you know, the coroner does suspect that this could have been the problem. Another more, or another better substantiated case is also from Quebec, and this is the case of an 80-year-old woman who developed peanut allergy after a blood transfusion. So the idea there being, you know, do we not need to start screening donors uh, for allergy? So these, these sort of bizarre stories help to create the idea that peanut allergy is something you really need to do, do something about. And of course, in the UK, we've had a number of cases, the uh, Natasha Ednan Laperouse case, where she died uh, uh, following a flight. This is also an area where lobby groups have played a big role. So in the United States, we have the Food Allergy Research and Education uh, Group, which is used to be uh, the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network. And because this particular lobby group focuses on a narrow definition of allergy, so focusing on anaphylactic type allergies, they have had the support of mainstream allergy and indeed the food and restaurant industry because they don't want to be seen as contributing to uh, fatal reactions. 
But the problem with that is that there are lots of people that don't suffer from uh, those specific anaphylactic allergies and suffer from other food allergies. So uh, FAIR, this lobby group, really is only lobbying for a certain group of patients. And we've seen in, in certain places, and we're seeing in the UK uh, today, Pub, bottom up uh, bottom up agitation for new legislation to protect people uh, who are vulnerable to food allergies. So in the case of Ontario, we have uh, in Canada again, we have Sabrina's Law. So this is passed in response to the death of Sabrina Shannon, who died after eating uh, French fries contaminated with dairy products. And it me meant that uh, schools had to come up with emergency plans uh, dealing with anaphylactic allergy. And in the UK, we've had the case of Ednan Laperuz and uh, better labeling uh, for food products. And so here we have a label from the United States, uh, which, which has changed in the last well, 16 years to make sure that people are more aware of the allergens in their food. Now, what's important there is that in the United States, they list, I believe, eight or nine, eight or nine foods can be listed in the list of, of uh, allergies here. You can see here some of these other things, natural and artificial flavoring, that's not mentioned. Uh, that's not listed as an allergen. Uh, flour or um, other types of flour aren't listed. High fructose corn syrup, which many uh, people believe is responsible for allergic or other types of uh, reactions, that's not listed either. So it, it's still a bit of a debate, uh, a debate. And then finally, we have cases where the food industry has capitalized on people's concerns about allergy. This is a peanut-free Mars bar uh, from Canada. It is produced in a peanut, completely peanut-free facility. And we've had other examples of this since in the UK. And of course, if you go to Tesco or other grocery stores, you get your allergy, or your free from aisles where you can shop in the in the uh, confidence that your food is is not containing certain allergens so what's the current state of affairs when it comes to allergy peanut allergy has definitely put food allergy on the map food allergy is still controversial but it is far less controversial than it used to be but this has meant that a, only a certain way of defining food allergy has become privileged so this is the narrow definition of food allergy. That, that's acceptable. If your allergy fits out with that, you might have problems getting a doctor to treat it seriously. There have also been, remember I mentioned desensitization. There, there have been recent trials in Cambridge and elsewhere trying to desensitize children to peanuts um, as well, which, which are really interesting. You know, kind of going back 100 years to when desensitization was used for food allergy before it was uh, rejected for uh, lack of effectiveness and for uh, danger. But on the other hand, we also get a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical companies in trying to take advantage of the situation. So uh, when o President Obama was in office, this EpiPen law was uh, passed to ensure that every school with allergic students, so every school, uh, has uh, always has a full supply of EpiPens that will not be out of date. Now, that's great for those allergic students. It's also very good for the pharmaceutical companies because they get paid for those EpiPens. Now, the final thing I'm going to say is really the ele elephant in the room. In amidst all the effort to prevent accidental exposures and debates about whether peanuts should be allowed here or there or anywhere, there's been very little focus on what causes these allergies in the first place. And as a historian, that's what I'm, that's kind of what I'm most interested in. Peanut allergy has been a phenomenon for the last 25, 30 years. We still don't know, we still really don't know why it is. Why, why are we seeing so many cases in the last 30 years and escalating? And why didn't we see them earlier? The little diagram on the right provides a few different possible explanations. 
but there's nowhere near enough research into these sorts of things. And I think given that there probably is some really profound um, explanations for why our immune systems are reacting in the, to the environment in the way they are in the form of allergy, we probably should be spending more time trying to investigate that. So that's me done. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer some questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm just going to come.